Hello, I'm Michael Harrison, Superintendent of the New Orleans Police Department. And I'm Paul Noel, Deputy Superintendent of the Field Operations Bureau. Today we're here to talk about demonstrations, protests, potential riots, how to prepare, how to plan, how to deploy, and how to make sure that people have their First Amendment rights protected, people stay safe, law enforcement is safe, and people are allowed to demonstrate and protest in a safe way for whatever the reason, and law enforcement can do it in a very successful way. On all of these incidents, I'm usually in a unified command with the fire chief, the head of our EMS, the mayor, and other officials assigned to the mayor's office. Chief Noel is usually on the ground working as an incident commander with an operations commander working under him for every demonstration and for every protest. The very first thing and the most important thing is accurate and timely intelligence. So that's working with our intelligence unit, our state fusion center, the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force, where we have a person, but some agencies may not have someone assigned to a, a regional JTTF. But you have to coordinate with your state fusion centers or local fusion centers or intelligence centers to be able to scroll social media to find out and ascertain when people are wanting to protest and demonstrate where they're going to be, what the potential crowd would look like, and what, where they want to go, what they want to do. To the extent that you can, every chief or deputy chief or their designee should work to establish communication with the leaders and organizers of every group to the extent you can. When you can do that, you're able to coordinate and negotiate the rules of engagement, lay out expectations, lay out consequences for those expectations, and agree to have everybody demonstrate, abide by the Constitution, protect everybody's right, and still allow them to have their say in a public space and everybody remain safe. As the superintendent just said, communication is critical for us to have a successful incident. What we do is we maintain an open line of communication, not only with the groups organizing the event, but we attempt to reach out to any possible counter-protesters. Identifying and learning who these counter-protesters is a key component of our intelligence plan. We want to know who's coming down because we have some people that are local. We have also people that sometimes they come in from out of town. And we want to identify who these individuals are and try to make contact with them, and again, to lay down the, the ground rules of the event. As we build out from our plan, the intelligence and the surveillance days and even weeks out is very important for, for conducting a safe event. What we learned from the last event that we had in New Orleans was some of the, the counter-protest groups actually placed vehicles loaded with firearms inside of the perimeter of our event and they were able to do that because they placed those vehicles in our perimeter several days before the event started before we actually set up our perimeter so the surveillance the intelligence gathering is very important as we as we move forward in, in these events we work very closely with our regional and state um, fusion centers to make sure we're able to gather and communicate this information not only within our own agency within our state police and other local law enforcement agencies that are going to be assisting us in this event. Based on intelligence gathering, that it's timely, that it's accurate, and that we've opened lines of communication with all protesters and with counter-protesters to the extent that we can, then it's about site survey and risk assessments and threat assessments. So we want to make sure that if we know where an organization is going to start, where they're going to march to, where they're going to protest and demonstrate, Certainly we want our intelligence officers and whatever help we can get from our regional and state partners to go and make risk assessments and threat assessments at those locations. So we can know vulnerable points where our officers would be unsafe from snipers, where our officers would be unsafe from people using other things like gas, throwing urine, throwing bricks or bottles or glass. We want to make sure that we can secure that area from start through a march all the way to the point where the demonstration will be held and then back again. And so we're constantly making threat assessments, surveying the area to make sure we know all the vulnerable weak spots. And then certainly on the day of a demonstration, we can sterilize those places and put people to keep them sterile so that our officers can be safe and so the protesters, counter protesters can be safe as well. Now as we shift to the day of the event, 
it's very important to make sure we have a good understanding of the mission that we're trying to accomplish. Again, our responsibility is not only to the safety and security of everybody involved, protesters and general public alike, but also to allow everyone who wants to come out and protest, allow them to be able to practice their constitutional rights to free speech, but to be able to do those things safely. So what we look at is we look at the, whatever the focal point is of the protest or the march or the, or the, or the vigil, is to make sure that, that that focal point is protected and safe. And what we like to do, whether it's a march or it's a vigil where people just come to gather, we like to have natural barriers that we like to put up to allow people to be separated but still protest. So what we do is we will separate the crowd naturally by having police barricades that are linked together for, for security. And we'll do like a two-sided pen. So the pen is open on two sides and then it is, it is barricaded in on two sides, which that allows people to to naturally move in and out of as they, as they see fit, but it doesn't pen them in, it doesn't corral them in. Remember, the Supreme Court doesn't allow us to pen people in and restrict their access, but we like to create natural barriers where they can naturally move in and out and also still safely practice their constitutional right to free speech. In between those barricades, we'll have a large enough area that separates the crowd to allow law enforcement to be able to work in but also have them close together where they don't try to intermingle, but we have a safe area in between that we can move our resources in and out of. When we set up our police coverage, we have numerous layers of police coverage. The first thing we have is we have, our, we have plainclothes officers that will be mingling in the crowd. Those officers are critical to any operations plan. Not only do they give us information that's going on in the crowd, but they help us identify potential agitators. Identifying and marking potential agitators or people who have done violence or property damage is critical to the success, success of running any event. What we like to do is when the crowd is starting to get agitated, our plainclothes people will broadcast a description of those, of those individuals that are really leading the agitation or the violence. And if, if necessary, we're able to extract those individuals, either go directly in and extract them, or if they wander on, on the outskirts of the event, then we can move in and get them. And that's a decision that we normally make on the ground, depending on how important it is. But again, that is very critical, because if you don't know who's causing violence, if you don't know who's agitating the crowd, then you either can't move in, or if you move in and you, you arrest random people, which really has the potential to turn the crowd against the police. It's always important to make sure that we keep the crowd on our side as much as possible. The next layer of coverage that we have is a uniform officers that are actually on the site and provide se security for the site itself. Those officers are in, in, in police uniform, they're not in riot gear, and they're trying to interact with the public and trying to provide as soft of coverage as we can. And that really keeps the public at ease, that keeps the protesters at ease, and it doesn't turn the crowd against the police. The next layer that we have is we'll have another layer of police officers in uniform off-site, and we could send them in in waves as the situation escalates. So if the situation escalates, we could send more officers in, and if it, if it de-escalates, then we could pull those officers out. So we like to have our coverage match the tempo and the mood of the crowd. It's also very important that we have rapid response, response units on the fringe of the event in case a group, a splinter group, or several splinter groups break off and try to go into other areas and, and do violence or commit vandalism. In New Orleans, we have a lot of historical areas. So it's very easy for a group of three to four anarchists to break off, go, go off on a separate, a separate way, and then go do property damage. If you don't have a rapid response team set up, to go directly at those individuals and extract them, you can have a very difficult time regulating this event. And finally, the last layer we have is our special operations team or our SWAT trained officers that are in riot gear. And we only will send them in as a last resort. We really try to handle all of the problems that we have with the uniform officers that we have on the scene. We, additionally, we'll have traffic officers on motorcycles 
they will be able to reroute traffic or respond to anything else that occurs. Again, if, if a group wants to break off and go block, block traffic or block streets, if it's a street that will allow them to block, instead of causing a problem, what we'll just do is divert traffic around the, around the blockage and allow traffic to continue to flow. The biggest tip that I could give anyone is have more officers available than you, need to, than you think you need to have. You need to have a reserve built in to deal with any type of unforeseen events that, that occur. Remember, you could be planning for one demonstration, but you could end up with three before it's over with. For the police officers on the scene to be able to successfully extract agitators and or people who have committed crimes quickly and quietly without causing another event or another disturbance to occur. The way we do that is our plainclothes officers monitor the individuals we want to extract. If it's critical that we do an extraction immediately, we will go directly in with a small group of police officers with another group in support in, in case they, they need assistance. We'll go directly to the individual that we want to extract, arrest them, handcuff them, and then immediately remove them from the crowd. If an extraction is not immediately necessary, the plainclothes officers will monitor that individual and normally at some point they'll move around the event. When they get closer to the outskirts, where we could extract them without as many people seeing and without the, with a, a, a reduced chance of violence or a reduced chance of the crowd becoming involved, once we see, see that opportunity, we will again move in with a small group of police officers, normally four to six police officers and a supervisor, will move in, will place that individual in handcuffs and immediately get him out of sight of the crowd. I want to talk a bit about command and control. For any event, you should have clear command and control. If your event has multiple stage locations, for example, a staging location with a protest, then a march, then another destination where there will be another demonstration or protest, there should be clear commanders for each one of those. For example, where they're staging, there should be a commander for that. If the march is a distance between point A and point B, a different commander should handle the march, and there should be a different commander at the point of interest. Whether it's a monument, whether it's a building, whether it's a park, there should be a, unif a, a command for that location. If there's a breakout of a fight or disruption, we want to make sure that the commander giving instructions who has eyes on the ground are giving those instructions. Of course, there are sergeants and lieutenants that supervisors supervising the troops that are on the ground. But we want to make sure that there's clear command and control and distinction between where something starts, the march, and where the main point of interest is. And so all of those people are communicating with each other, but the instructions given are given by a commander who has eyes on the ground. Certainly your ops plan should reflect the distinction between the different command and control which should all be under the command and control of one incident commander. All of that should be constantly coordinated, but it does require practice. And to the extent that you can practice or do a dry run of an extraction of mobilizing officers with barricades, you should do that. If time permits, resources permit, you should do those dry runs to practice so officers know exactly how to do an extraction, where to bring an agitator, bring that agitator out of sight, out of mind, get the agitator passed off, passed off to a transport, get back in line, and get back on the line to pr provide more protection for the demonstration. Make sure your ops plan reflects that, but everybody should know what his or her assignment is at all times, and everybody should know who's given the instructions at different points of a protest or demonstration. We're fortunate in New Orleans where we have several local ordinances which prohibit carrying firearms, either open carry or concealed, during a demonstration. We also have ordinances that prohibit masking during, during these events as well. So what we do is to encourage people not to come to these events with firearms is we communicate with them well in advance and we let them know the different ordinances that we have that prohibit these items. When we do have individuals show up with open carry rifles and firearms, we hand them a copy of the ordinance and we ask them to go put their weapons up 
and we don't immediately come in and arrest them. And we really try to get cooperation between the different groups and get them to comply with our laws. The last demonstration that we had after we passed these laws out, the groups kind of argued amongst themselves for about 10 minutes trying to decide what they were going to do. We gave them that time because eventually what happened is they decided to comply with the law and they go put they, they went and put their weapons up. So it was worth us giving giving them that additional time to comply with the law and avoid a possible hostile confrontation. But if you're in a situation where your, your community does not have one of these laws that prohibit these weapons, you may end up with a demonstration with people with open carry firearms. If you have a permitting process in, in a closed area, maybe you know you have to speak with your, your, your attorney, you may, may be able to prohibit those weapons through your permitting process, and that's something that you should speak with with your, your either agency or your governmental attorney. If you're not able to prohibit those weapons, it's very important to show those people carrying weapons that we are out there in force and we're not going to tolerate any type of violence. What we have done in New Orleans in the past is actually had the visible display of our snipers in the area to let everyone see that we're out in force and we're out there and we're capable to respond to anything that may occur. We also have prisoner transport wagons and sometimes we'll bring them in close so people can see that we have the ability, if we do need to make mass arrest, that we can arrest and remove a large amount of individuals from the area very quickly. So Chief, everything we've talked about is about gathering intelligence, timely and accurate intelligence, turning that intelligence into actions, preparation, deployment, and so for departments that have resources, use them. What can be known, you should know it. What can be used, you should use it. You should do everything possible to use every piece of equipment to barricade or block every street leading into where protesters are so that no vehicle or no driver of any vehicle could use that vehicle to crash into people or protesters. So every big truck that your agency has, you should use to block streets. Or if you have barricades or bollards, you should use them. To the extent that you can coordinate with the organizers of groups to bring them in to a route that you have predetermined and surveyed and did your threat assessments, you should keep them on that route. And if you have to march them back, march them back the same way. But make sure every street is blocked or barricaded with big equipment so no truck or no car could penetrate and cause harm to the protesters or demonstrators. Everything that we have been talking about today really leads down to preparation. So now is the time to, to really take a hard look, a critical look at your agency and, and ask yourself, are we prepared for an event today? And you need to look at everything. How many gas masks do you have? One thing we saw out of the, the protest in Baltimore and other places was that many agencies didn't have enough gas masks. So when, it, when, when time came to deploy gas to break up riots and civil unrest, Every police officer that, that did not have a gas mask had to leave that area, including, including the command team. So do you have enough gas masks? Do your officers know how to put the gas mask on? That may sound like a silly question, but when we start looking and we start issuing gas masks, we had officers that had, been, had gone through training, but there was a long time between them going through the training and them actually having to use a, a possibly use a gas mask. If they put the gas mask on and it's not on correctly and we deploy gas, they're going to be taken out of action. Are your officers riot trained? Are all of your officers riot trained? Do you have metal barricades? Do you have the large trucks like the superintendent just talked about? We use trucks, not only police vehicles, but we've used trucks from other municipal agencies to, to block streets and protect not only, not only um, the public, but protect law enforcement as well. Do you have other items wedges, different, different types of things that we can bring in to secure your command post and secure other areas. Again, now is the time to prepare. If you have a monument in your city that's not had a protest around it yet, one may very well be coming. So now is the time to actually draw a plan up for that particular mo monument. So what we did in New Orleans is we identified many sites where protests could occur. 
and we have plans ready to go for all of those events, all of those sites. Now, those plans may change depending upon the particular aspects of the protest, but we've already looked at those sites, we've identified the vulnerable aspects, and we have a good plan in place already. We hope this has been helpful. We've had a number of these in New Orleans all year and last year, and we've had a lot of success with them, but we also know that anything can happen at any time. That's why planning and preparation is paramount. So if you don't have those resources, start right now acquiring those resources. Start right now doing your due diligence. What can be known should be known. What can be used should be used. This, this affects the entire city or the entire county. So you should have at your disposal every asset within the city or county government. Every big truck and every resource. So if there are any questions, please give us a call here to New Orleans Police Department. We will be more than happy to help you with specific issues. But right now it is important that everybody do their own threat assessment, their risk assessments, and make sure you have the resources to deploy because everybody's facing the same thing right now. Once again, thank you very much.